welcome to Umbrella Rebellion. I'm Marcy. And I'm Dee. We are finding healing after leaving a cult. We will be discussing abuse and personal experience with the ATI, IBLP, and fundamental churches. Trigger warning. This podcast may contain descriptions of various forms of abuse. Please take care for your safety and well-being while you are listening. If the content becomes too much for you to handle, please turn this off. We hope to expose harmful teachings that lead to and justify abuse. With the hope that those that are experiencing abuse can find support and escape from it. Welcome to Umbrella Rebellion. Hey, Marcy. Hey, D. Hey, everybody. So we are going to start our mental health series. We had kind of talked to y'all about some of the things you wanted to see in season two. So mental health was one of the focuses. And so we kind of wanted to start with, basically, we talked about the checklist of how we figured out we were being abused was by a checklist. And so we kind of just want to go over the definitions of the different types of abuse, hit on some points that we find valuable, and kind of give you possibly some resources. Basically, everything that we're going to read or go over today is stuff that I pulled off the internet. If you see us looking down, it's because we're reading it because we can't memorize all of the stuff. So, and then we may just, you know, add a little bit of personal experience and, and how these kinds of things played out in our lives. Sometimes a checklist isn't enough. It's like, what does that really look like to identify it as an action and not as just a checklist? First, we want to start off by saying that there are more types of abuse than just physical abuse. The types of abuse that we're going to go through in this series are going to be verbal, emotional, spiritual, and or religious, and financial as well as the physical abuse. All right, so we're going to discuss verbal abuse today. How do you know the difference between verbal abuse and what a normal argument is, right? That's kind of like, is this just an argument or is this actually abuse? So that's kind of what we're going to go over today. So obviously, in any kind of relationship, you're going to come into place where you have a disagreement and it can lead to some passionately heated conversations and you know sometimes you lose your temper and you yell and that's not always abuse so how do you tell the difference right so a normal argument might like you said d include (laughs) be passionately heated or include some yelling but the problem with an abusive one would be it would wear you down and seem normal to you because it happens so often. And we've kind of talked about that kind of thing before where it, things just happen so often that it seems normal after a while. So some examples of what a normal one would look like was would be that they don't dissolve into name calling or personal attacks. So that would be a way to know whether what would be a normal thing or what you just get used to because you're it just wears you down. Is if they call names or it's personal attack against you? Is it just a discussion? You're always the reason that things are going wrong would be a personal attack. It's your fault I did this kind of personal attack is what I equate that to. Yeah, that was my experience. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, another thing is, is that they don't happen every day. So I think I can count on one hand, the quote unquote arguments or disagreements Jeremy and I have had in, what's today's date? Is it the 19th yet? I think it's the 18th, huh? No. Tomorrow will be five years (laughs) that we've known each other. And I can count on one hand the amount of arguments we've had. So arguments revolve around a basic issue. That's a normal thing. A normal argument isn't a character assassination. Right. And so being from IBLP, ATI... We know all the character qualities. <laughs> so if you're being attacked that you aren't graceful and agreeable and, you know, like trying to tear down your character would be abuse as opposed to just saying, this is my problem. This is an issue. We need to address it. Let's find a solution. It's always attacking you would be the difference between an argument and abuse. 
I was thinking I had told this to someone I know this week. One of the personal attacks that I often endured was that he would say, don't laugh like that. That, That's your mom's laugh. I don't like that. Don't laugh like that. It was a little thing. It was, but it was a personal attack. He would go on bouts of it where he would bring it up over and over and over again every single day for like a week. And then he would let it go. And then he would bring it up again. And Mm -hmm. he he did it because he knew it brought shame to me or that it bothered me. And Mm -hmm. getting an emotional reaction. That's a personal attack. <laughs> right. Not, you can't change your laugh. It shouldn't be a big issue. It shouldn't be even something that he's bringing up. You know, it's just attacking your joy. Mm-hmm. So in, in the same vein, I'm a loud person. I have a loud voice. My voice carries. I laugh loud. I also sneeze loud. So <laughs> <laughs> those were things that he would attack. My loud sneezing. Yeah. I can't control it, you know. Uh, my loud laugh I would have to consciously like think about my laugh and try to temper it when he was in a mood and even before that I mean the laugh thing was with my ex but also with the cult growing up my Mm -hmm. dad would Marcy you are loud your voice carries you need to be quiet and because women are supposed to be meek calm and quiet keepers of the home so he didn't yeah. like it. He would tell me to be quiet all the time. <laughs> the problem yeah. is, are loud. All of us are. It wasn't just me. <laughs> right. We just are loud people. <laughs> <laughs> Your voice was just the loudest. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Being bossy big sister, probably. <laughs> like, even those kids that you had, Dad, in line. <laughs> right. That's right. You should be thankful. They can hear yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. Uh So in a normal argument, you listen and try to understand the other person's position, even when you're angry. So it's not going to get to a yelling match necessarily. You might get a little agitated or upset and loud, but, you know, an argument is both listening and speaking your position, right? Like it's a two-sided thing, whereas when it's verbal abuse, it's typically always Mm one-sided yeah I even tried to take turns or explain that to my sometimes where I would say let me speak and then let me finish and then you can speak and then you finish and then I won't speak until you're ready and then we'll like I tried to train him how to (laughs) have a normal and it never worked yeah no they have to be right yeah because he had to be right all the time he Mm -hmm. would even tell me well I win I have to win I'm always. Wow. Oh, okay. So one of you may yell or say something truly awful out of frustration, but it's an unusual occurrence and you work through it together. So mistakes are made. People say things that they don't mean or didn't intend to be that harsh, <clears throat> but you're going to end up working it out in the end when it's not an unusual occurrence. If it happens all the time. For instance, I've said some things out of, you know, frustration and the relationship with Jeremy and he just gives me this look and he's like <laughs> and I'm like oh yeah that wasn't nice was it and it's like I'm really sorry that is not my intention of what I was trying to say this was what I was really trying to say but I couldn't find the words at the time so I was ugly right and then the thing is is that you try not to do that again whereas when it's a verbal abuse situation, there's no attempt to stop the behavior that is negative. Right. Right. And they might even expound upon it. Like I found that my ex, if he realized that something bothered me, if I showed emotion because narcissists all crave emotional input, that's the whole point is to get you to respond, whether it's positive or negative. That if he found that something got an extreme reaction from me, whether it was good or bad, that he would do it again and then do it more extreme. Mm-hmm. Saying something awful and then taking it two shades further just to get the reaction. Something that I have started saying to my girls to combat that, to teach how to not do that, is if they say something really awful to me, like, you're being mean or I hate you or something, kids do that. I respond to them and say, think about that. What you're saying is not true. Or if kids say, I don't love you anymore. I'm not going to be your best friend. 
you know, say, think about that. That's not true what you're saying. So we don't say it. So don't attack them for, or act her or anything like that. I just say, that's not true. So I don't believe it. Yeah. And we, truth, we don't say lies. You can't say that. Yeah. I guess I have a little bit of a different approach with mine because I have a child that's on the spectrum and, you know, two of my three have ADHD. So impulse control is very hard for my children. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that because I also had emotional impulse control issues when I was a kid. So I don't ever take anything personal that they tell me. Yes. It's not a personal attack to me. I always view it as my child is having difficulty managing their emotions and they're having verbal diarrhea. Yes. You yes. Know? Well, I don't ever take it personally yeah. because I'm, they're a kid and also they just don't manage emotions. What I was trying to do is get them to think about what they're saying to try to label the emotions they're having. Right. And, you know, or, or label the thoughts that they're having. Yeah. And so what I would do is redirect it to, okay, you may not love me right now in this moment. I understand that. And that is okay. You know, it's okay for you not to feel love towards me right now because you're upset. But let's try and figure out, let's try and figure out what is causing you to be upset. So tell me why you don't love me right now. Yes. And then you get to the root of the problem instead of a back and forth of like, okay, sure, why not? And just dismiss them, you know, because you know it's really just verbal diarrhea and it's not really how they feel and they're going to change it in three minutes when they want something from you. So, <laughs> so that's kind of been like my process with my kids is, okay, you said something not nice, whatever. I don't care. Not that I don't care, but like it's, I'm not taking it personal. Yeah. I understand you may not love me right now. Validate their feelings. Yeah. But let's find out why you don't love me right now. Like give me the reason and then let's try and see if we can fix this. Right. Okay, so I guess that would be an example. Those things that we shared about children would be an example of working through it together. So, or your example of your husband where you, he just gives you a look and says, hmm. right. that would be a way of working through it together. That would be right. And it doesn't devolve into knockdown, drag out a verbal argument. It's just, okay, let's take a pause. This was not okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, the next point would be even if you can't agree completely, you're able to compromise or move on without punishments or threat. This is a big one. This mm -hmm. is a huge thing that I dealt with. Oh, compromise. It wasn't even a thing. It wasn't for me either. There was no compromise. It was his way or the highway. And he told me that flat out all the time. It's my way there or the highway. You can choose. If I didn't choose to comply, he would wait me out. Mm -hmm. So he would just wait if I complied. Like he will of iron like and then you had like the consequences of i yes you had like the silent treatment ignoring you all that kind of stuff that he would do i've had multiple relationships where it was the dynamic was very one-sided of it's my way and if you don't do it my way then the relationship that i had when i was in the air force that ended when i went to korea it was very one-sided because I had crossed a boundary. I didn't know I, I crossed. And the consequence was no relationship, right? And so throughout the rest of our interaction, it was if I did anything wrong, it was pull back and you don't get me, right? Yes. I was actually going through back through Pinterest quotes the other night, and I found one about how being ignored has the same chemical reaction in your brain as being physically abused. Mm. So same, same brain reaction, same abuse, like causes the same damage in your brain. It's just not physical. And that, that is usually what happened if I didn't comply. So I would be ignored or, or woken up at 3 a.m. <laughs> and yelled at in a drunken rage. So yeah. Yeah. There's no middle ground. That's, there was, yeah. Yes, there's no middle ground. <laughs> yeah, with react with bad reactions, good reactions, with you know disagreements. There's no, there really is no middle ground. It's either all or none. 
when it's in an abusive relationship. It's either complete restriction or over the top response. So arguments aren't a zero sum game. One person won't win at the detriment of the other. So if you truly are in a balanced relationship, neither one is going to want to hurt the other. There, there's not a, we're going to make this decision at the detriment of somebody else. In an abusive relationship, it will always be at the de detriment of you. <laughs> well, because you're not even considered. It's yeah. not even, mm -mm. it's not even like I'm doing this to cause you pain. It's like, you don't matter to me. So it doesn't matter if it causes you pain. Where in the healthy relationship I have right now in some of the other I think one or two relationships that I've had, it was always, you know, how can I make this easier for you? Or how can I make this better for you? Yes. What are you willing to deal with as opposed to, I am going to enforce this upon you, whether you like it or not. All right. So we're going to go over red flags. So consider it a red flag when the other person engages in these behaviors. They insult or attempt to hum humiliate you. So, example, the laugh, when he attacked the laugh that it said he didn't like it and then it was like my mother's. It was purposefully humiliating. He went after me and he went after my family heritage. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you come from something I don't like. So. Yeah, that was another thing. Like, he would, my mom is a very controlling person and so, and she kind of gets her way a lot in her marriage and so he would attack that. Like, you're just acting like your mom because you just want to get your way. So the next one would be, then they accuse you of being overly sensitive. Oh my gosh. And say <laughs> that it was a joke and you have no sense of humor. Yes. Big one. Yeah. Yep. So he would say that about my laugh. I don't like it. I would get all embarrassed or upset or, or ashamed. And he would say, I wasn't that big of a deal. I don't know why you're making a big deal out of it. Why are you so upset over such a little <laughs> thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mine was overreacting over things that were like behaviors of his. Okay. So one thing that drove me nuts was when we went to the grocery store, he would grab a banana. Bananas are charged by weight. If you eat it, you can't p pay for it. Because it's by weight. So to me, that was stealing. And it upset me a lot because it was just one of those things like you're taking something that's not yours and you have no care for how that affects anybody. The business, me, you know, and it really upset me. And he would do it all the time. And I'm like, you're stealing. No, it's not. I'm going to pay for it. I'm like, it's charged by weight. You ate it. How are you going to pay for it? You know, and it's like, I think eventually after like years of him doing that, he would have them weigh a banana twice to pay for it, to appease me. <laughs> but it was years later after having an issue with it. I mean, almost every single time he would eat a banana when he walked in the grocery store without paying for it first. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then he would compare it to, I would grab a donut out of the donut case and I would eat it because sometimes as a mom, you just don't get any food. You're like, if I don't eat, I'm going to buy the whole grocery store. So, but I would yeah. have them charge, <laughs> they would have them charge me for it at the thing. And I'm like, well, I can still have them charge me for it because it's not, it's not by weight. It's by quantity. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. And then you leave feeling crazy because they like you're trying to explain this to them and they want to acknowledge it. And so then you feel like you're a crazy person for being worried about that. That translates into a lot of other areas too, where they'll just state it over and over again, over again from their point of view. Yours is logical, you know it is, but you hear their viewpoint so often that you get really it leaves you really confused. Yeah, it makes you think, well, am I making a big deal out of nothing? Is this really a big issue? You know, like getting on my high horse and being judgmental or, you know, because they'll tell you you're being judgmental. And it's like when you're a woman and you're in the fundamental church, I know your relationship really wasn't based on that. Mine was, is I'm supposed to be submissive. So if he says it's not wrong, then it's not wrong. Mm -hmm. And so then I'm like, but it's wrong. And... 
I can't, I don't know. I can't justify this in my brain. It's so hard. Yeah, that was my struggle. And it starts out small with things like bananas mm -hmm. or you won't like this movie or you won't, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. It starts out small like that so that you're already broken in that area. So when something bigger that really is a huge issue, then you don't fight. So for example, very small thing like the banana uh, happened all the time. So when at the end, when he had a stroke and couldn't, we couldn't keep up with bills, his car was on the verge of being repossessed and I wanted to give it back. I wanted, the people were calling, they were asking for it. I was trying to set up a time to give them the car. Like I was trying to be honest about it. Mm -hmm. He wanted to hide it. Mm -hmm. And he, he talked me into, or almost forced me into, I really didn't have a choice. So I would say forced me mm -hmm. into hiding his car, at least. Mm -hmm. for and I finally talked him out of it because I threatened to get other people involved and we ended up mm -hmm. giving it back. But small things. And then I had no gumption to fight him on something really big like the car. Yeah. And I mean, even if you did, I mean, you obviously protested, but your protest was not heard. And so. No, small is much smaller than it would have been at the beginning. Right. Like, this was seven years in. Right. So that protest was very small because I had lost so many previous small arguments. Right. Right. So, yeah. So it breaks down your will to fight. So you just disagree because you, you can, okay, well, I said my piece. So you're conscious, you kind of like convince yourself that your conscience is clear because you've said that you've disagreed with it, but you know, you have no choice. And sometimes you go along with stuff that you know is not right. Yeah. 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 Because you feel like you don't have a choice. And in some cases you don't. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and we say that be everybody has a choice, right? But when you're broken down and you feel like you have no way out, we want you to understand that we've been there and it got to a point where we did realize that we needed to get out. And it took a really long time from taking a banana to hiding a car that's being repossessed, you know, or, you know, hiding drug use. The issues get bigger and you realize you have no voice in your, in your relationship. And so you go along with a lot of things to keep the peace. And then one day you wake up and go, this is not who I want to be. These are not the actions that I want to be a part of. And then you decide to, to leave. I mean, it does, it's kind of the way it goes, right? But it's usually a long time between the banana and hiding a car. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they frequently yell or scream at you. So I wasn't unfamiliar with yelling because I kind of grew up with that kind of thing happening sometimes in anger, but it happened much more frequently and it wasn't something like it would come out of the blue. It, it wasn't predictable. It wasn't instigated. Like it was because of something I did, or if, if it was, it was something very small. So it wasn't. Uh, manageable. It was, I was always on eggshells. You can't, mm -hmm. couldn't ever tell when it's going to hit you. Yeah. I mean, like I know one time he like started slamming cabinets in the kitchen because I left one open, you yeah. know, and that was, I mean, explosive reaction to leaving a cabinet open, you know? Yeah. It's just the, it's almost like the, the yelling is not warranted at that time. Like you can understand if somebody's upset and they've just lost their temper, but minor inconveniences shouldn't warrant being yelled at. Okay, so arguments take you by surprise, but you get blamed for starting them. Oh, classic, classic. Yeah, I wouldn't have yelled at you if you wouldn't have left the, the cabinet door open. If you would just close things behind you, then I wouldn't have to yell at you. Mm-hmm. Mine frequently, I think the biggest one for me, this happened also during the day like that for me as well, but uh, what frequently happened also was that he would get drunk overnight because he would stay up all night and drink. He would hit whatever number it was of beers that he hit that made him go over the edge. And it was usually about between two and four in the morning and he would come and wake me up <laughs> and want to yell at me because he was angry in his head about whatever it was he was angry about. He would wake me up and yell at me and want to argue with me at two in the morning, wake me up out of dead sleep. Um, and mind you, I had tiny babies or I was pregnant. Mm. I was pregnant yeah. or I had tiny babies. I wasn't sleeping at all anyway. 
you know, had very, very little sleep. So yes, <laughs> I would be like, where is this coming from? Like, I don't even right. like, why didn't you say, that, you know, at, at the moment, you know, Get, you were never awake in the moments that he got upset because you were sleeping like a normal person. No, right. right. <laughs> Those were the worst ones. Those were the most violent ones. There are things like that happened during the day too, where he would, you know, it would take me by surprise and I'd be like, yeah. when did you get mad? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you were just fine. Like, where is this going? There was no buildup, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I just fed you your favorite meal. Like, why are you angry? <laughs> the new agreement sets off a string of accusations and dredging up of unrelated issues to put you on the defense. <sighs> past keeping score that's what i called it yeah yeah hit, hit for tat hit for tat yeah if i brought up anything mm -hmm. that was annoying me or that i thought was wrong or uh, like if like the car thing or the banana thing it would go it would go sideways really fast he would find something the that you had done he... wrong even if it had been years ago and it, a lot of times it would be like years ago, things being dredged up. Well, and it also took the focus off of what was wrong, what I was mad at him about. So it took the argument away from the true issue to something else. He loved to derail and, and put you on the defensive in a different stream. And sometimes I find us way down the stream and I'd be like, wait a minute, this started out over here. And I would try to redirect us back over there and it, it never worked. Arguments were always circular because of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. There was never an end to it. And it's just you argue until they, they wear you down and you give up and you're like, whatever. Yeah, exactly. This isn't going to get resolved. So there's no point in continuing this. Mm -hmm. I'm beat up enough. You know, ver I'm verbally beat up enough. I'm, I'm going to stop I, and, you know, try and calm down somehow, you know, exactly. to be able to go to sleep, to take care of kids the next day. Right. And I was often was not allowed to walk away once the argument was... Mm started we he we, I wasn't allowed to walk away I couldn't say I disagree let's think about this and come back to this discussion that was never allowed he had yeah. to be right had to be wrong mm -hmm. there had to be a conclusion of you're right and then we can you know and I think my I may be recollecting this incorrectly so I say that right now but I'm pretty sure mine walked off a lot my ex walked off a lot when there was an argument and it would just be the end of the argument. Mm -hmm. So if I brought something up and then he, you know, well, you did this and that and that and the other, and then I'm so upset and I'm just going to go, you know, bank shit around, you know, that was kind of, okay, well then I guess we're done. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by better help. Have you been struggling lately? Maybe you're having difficulty in relationships or with difficult thoughts, feelings. We are definitely people who can understand how that can be difficult, especially after leaving a cult. Therapy for me was extremely important after leaving the cult and abuse. And it was difficult to find time to get to one where you schedule an appointment, you had to drive there, you had to leave work. I think with better help, this sounds amazing because you can schedule it around your appointments or work or children. Children was a thing for me. And something that I liked about that they said was available was that you could text message a counselor. There were multiple times where I would get triggered and have panic issues and things like that, where it would have been really nice to be able to just message someone and have them talk me through that moment. If you can relate to this need, then BetterHelp wants to help you today. BetterHelp offers licensed therapists who are trained to listen to help you. Talk to your therapist in private, online environment at your convenience. You just need to fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs, including financial, and then you get matched with your therapist in another 48 hours. Then you schedule secure video and phone sessions, Plus, you can exchange unlimited messages, and everything you share is completely confidential. You can request a new therapist at no additional charge anytime. And as Marcy and I have experienced, sometimes each therapist is not the best fit that we've seen, or we get to a point where we need somebody that can help us with a different aspect of our recovery. And so 
I've been to multiple therapists as well. Yes, I have too. I went to a therapist for the abuse. I went to a therapist for the cult and I've had to go through several to find the right one that was the best fit. Join the 2 million plus people who have taken charge of their mental health with an experienced BetterHelp therapist. We have a special offer to Umbrella Rebellion listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash Umbrella Rebellion. That's betterhelp.com slash Umbrella Rebellion. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. So they try to make you feel guilty and position themselves as the victim. Oh my gosh, yes. So it's kind of like they, okay, so the argument comes out of nowhere. They start yelling and screaming at you, blaming you for their poor reaction or telling you that you're overreacting and this isn't that big of a deal. And then they, you know, well, you do this and that's why, you know, like this is why I'm the way I am because you did X, Y, Z. So it's your fault I'm this way and I'm the victim here, you know, shifting the blame is what I would call it. Yeah, blame shifting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He did that quite often to me too. Well, you made me mad. You did, you did dishes or you didn't do whatever, whatever small item it was, we, that which made me mad. So it's your fault. Right. If you, would, <laughs> if you would just be a good, submissive, obedient wife, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Next. Next. It is. They save their hurtful behaviors for when you are alone, but act completely different when others are around. Yes. So I'm trying to think of a good example of that. Church for us. Yeah. He was always Mr. Charismatic at church and he would, he would never blow up at the kids when they were getting disciplined and he would like have the perfect spanking response in church Mm -hmm. but when we were home it was the spankings were so much worse for them yeah yeah my ex was not a social person anyway he preferred to stay home he's more of a hermit and so it did we didn't have a lot of those behaviors outside now with family he was just silent he just didn't engage much Um, if he did disagree he would save it till later like he wouldn't let me know in the moment he would just uh, save it till later till 2 a.m and then he'd get angry and corner me in the kitchen and punch a cabinet or punch a door. <laughs> All of our houses had holes. <laughs> there were several instances where he showed his ass, as I, I call it. He showed his ass to people that I knew. And for me, it was embarrassing. And it made me not want to bring him around the people I cared about because he was an asshole to them or he created tension that I didn't feel like they deserved. And so one day my mom told me, like, it is really hard to be around y'all because all you do is argue and fight. And pretty much any holiday that we had together with my family was ruined because he had some kind of problem with something and it devolved into a fight because he couldn't allow me to spend time with my family. Yeah. And so he had to create tension to be able to remove us from that situation and make me want to leave. Yeah. I have, that's what I think it was. He would either be silent at family things or he, for example, the same thing that you're talking about right after I had a baby and I had planned and he knew this, I had planned for my mom to be there for a week and, and then for another person, maybe the mother-in-law or somebody to be there for a week so that I would have help. And he created, there was only a day where the two moms crossed over, Right where they were both there at the same time. And I forget how that happened, but he created tension by telling me that his mom had a problem and then my mom had a problem. And he just created this whole big old lie of this whole thing where our moms couldn't get along and that my mom needed to leave. Oh, or, wow. And I insisted that she stay a little bit later, but then when she did stay, then he created more of a problem with it, like, I think she stayed maybe two more days, two or three more days. And he created another problem to get me to tell her to leave. He told me to make my mother leave after I had had this baby. So, and I didn't have any help mm. and, and I wanted help so badly 
And I bawled because I felt so bad that I had to send my mother away. Right. Mm -hmm. And he didn't take care of me. And I knew if I sent my mom away, he was not going to take care of me. I would be all alone and there would be no recovery time. I knew that because I knew he never took care of me at all. He never cared. And so I knew that that my help was going away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, bless her, I think she realized what was happening. I think she saw what, that it was not me. And she was very gracious about that. I think that's, unfortunately, that's one of the benefits of our parents being in the cult that they were, is that they would never make the situation worse because they were, especially the moms, because they were the tried to be the peacekeepers right and they would tell us when our spouses weren't around at the time sometimes they would say like that was kind of weird or you know this this was kind mm -hmm. of a you know and we would talk about it separately but never in front of our ex-husbands and then you know they also wanted to try and keep our marriages together so they wouldn't try, they would not try to heap coals on the fire is what I call it, you know. So it was a, a lot of the peacekeeper and what is one of the other buzzwords, character qualities that I'm trying to think of? Peacemaker? Uh, mediator or something like that. So yeah, it's just the whole women are, you know, seen and not heard and sometimes not even seen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that. I, my family never like spent the night and I had to ask him if it was okay for my family to come over. And if he wasn't in a mood to have my family come over, then they didn't. Yeah. You know, and it was like, it wasn't about what I wanted or if I wanted to spend time with family or if I needed their help for something, you know, it yeah. was based on what he could handle. So the next one, red flag, would be they get into your personal space or block you from moving away. Like Marcy had said, he wouldn't let her leave until the argument was over. There were several instances where I wanted to leave and I was blocked from leaving the house, stood in the doorway, physically intimidating me. And because his reactions were so, like, out of the blue and unexpected i never knew how big the reactions were going to be if i pushed it mm -hmm. i think i'm trying to think like there was two instances where physically i did not back down and he wound up like on top of me i was pregnant both times wrestling me for the keys mm -hmm. and so i said he tackled me he argued that he didn't tackle me you know, so, but he physically restrained me all the way to the ground. Yeah. However right. you want to call that. <laughs> yeah. That's the other thing is definitions of words. Mm -hmm. That I would say he did something like you tackled me. I didn't tackle you. Like I, I was just trying to get the keys. You resisted. Yes. 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 Well, because you were drunk. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't want you to drive. Toward the end, when it was getting worse, and and I more often wanted to leave, he tried to disconnect my battery out of my car. He jumped out in front of my car because I made it to the car with the, with the baby. And I got in, and he w jumped out in the middle of the road in front of me so that I couldn't go. He knew I was getting ready to leave or he was afraid that I was going to do that again. And so he went out to my car, was gone for a few minutes, came back in and said, I let all the airs out of, out of all four of your tires. You can't leave. Oh, wow. And then at the final thing was that he took my keys and my phone and hid them so that I couldn't go. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I never, I never got to the point where he physically stopped my vehicle from working. Now... I didn't have a vehicle for a while because it needed an engine repair, but I don't think that was an intentional thing to keep me at home. And that was very early in our relationship, but there was, okay. So this is one of the things I think that made me fear him like harming me physically. We were in an argument. I was pregnant for Samuel. I got out of the car at a red light. I went to walk in front of it. And he revved the engine and scooted forward and almost hit me. 
And I, I kind of had forgotten about that until you just had talked about him, you know, your ex and the car issue. I think that was one of the times I went and stayed with my parents for a couple of days. I was, I was so scared. I, I was like, he, he, if he was mad enough, he probably would have run me over while I was pregnant, which mm -hmm. just really so scary. Yeah. So that would have been an example of physical, like actual action toward you. So this verbal, so mine started out verbal. So I talked about him mm -hmm. actions against me, like taking the battery out or letting the air out before that, before it became that intense he always controlled me with verbal fear. So verbal mm -hmm. things like, I can take you out and take our daughter and disappear and no one will ever see her again. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, well, you can't do that. I'm pregnant with your second child. You'd hurt your second child. He said, I can do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So he, the verbal part of it, the verbal fear was put there first. And then when he realized that I didn't fear that verbal stuff anymore and that I was still running, even though he told me that mm -hmm. and successful a couple of times mm -hmm. that then the actions became more escalated because he mm -hmm. wrote grip was waning. <laughs> yeah. He had to up the ante precursor to that. One of the things that was always told to me multiple times repetitively was that if you hit me, I will hit you back and you probably won't get up. Yeah. 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 So there was only one time I ever did anything I think that would be considered, yeah, it would be considered physical violence is I took a full gallon of water and chucked it across the room. I was aiming for him and I missed him like by three feet, but I was, it was just one of those times where it was just like, I cannot deal with what you're doing to me. It has to stop. And that's when I, that was probably a couple of months before I filed for divorce the first time. Mm -hmm. So, and I was honestly scared that even though I didn't hit him with it, that he was going to retaliate. And thankfully he did not. Yeah. So. He had, he had planted too many lies of, in my head at the beginning of the relationship purposefully. It was when the relationship was happy and good and I was head over hills, hook, line, and sinker. There was nothing wrong. And he planted those things then so that later when something did happen, then he already had those planted. So he told me he was a red beret and that he had done black op missions and all these things that qualified him to have all the expertise necessary to inflict on me whatever he wish, wished. Yeah. Or disappear yeah. if you needed to with Embry. So, yeah. or with, with Pixie, the first Pixie, original Pixie. Yeah. So those things, those, that's a mental abuse. So mental abuse that turned into verbal abuse that went to physical abuse. It's always a progression. Yeah. It starts out small and it builds. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I think the verbal abuse red flags are where you can go, oh, no, this is not okay. And you can save yourself from a lot of stuff if you end the relationship when you see, you know, multiple red flags. And I'm not saying, like, if somebody makes a mistake and acts inappropriately once or twice in, in your relationship or, you know, y'all have a really bad argument once here and there. This is typically weekly, daily, every other day. It's not once every three months, once every six months. This is a constant, constant thing that you are experiencing in your relationship. And there's like, it's almost like when you finally, this is kind of how I always was waiting for that other shoe to drop. When it was good, it was like, okay, it was, it's been good for a week. So when is it going to go bad? You yeah. know, if you, if you feel that way in your relationship, that's a red flag. And you're like, okay. And, and it's not going to stop at verbal abuse, you know? Oh, well, I can deal with it because it's just verbal abuse. It won't stop there. It's only going to escalate. It always does. Yes. I would say the same thing. 
that if you see that happening, it will only escalate. It does not get better. Mm -hmm. If they're willing to do that to you, then they're going to, it will get worse. Also, I think that if you can stop it, if you can see it now and get out before it gets that bad, if you're at the verbal abuse point, that's great. If you're not, Mm -hmm. if you're at the physical abuse point, Mm -hmm. part of me even being able to acknowledge that I was being abused, I could not mentally wrap my head around the fact that I was an abused, physically abused woman. But so it started small. I had to admit that I was verbally abused first, that Mm -hmm. what he was saying to me was not okay. So it was verbal. And then I had to step it up in my mind, even though I got out at the physical abuse for me to be able to even call it abuse six months after I had gotten out, I had to step it up. So if you can acknowledge that there's small pieces of abuse, but you can't get to that other part yet, it's okay. Just, yeah. you know, it may take a while for your brain to wrap around that. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, and, and you're in trauma mode, right? If you're in, yeah. if you're experiencing any abuse, verbal, physical, emotional, spiritual, financial, you are in survival mode. And so your brain has to switch from survival mode to being able to process decisions as a normal human being that's not experiencing trauma, which is really hard to get out of the fog of abuse to make those decisions because you have been conditioned to question everything you think mm-hmm. as and as invalid. Mm-hmm. So it, even if you've thought for three, four, five years that the way that he speaks to me is disrespectful, that this is abusive and you're also experiencing physical abuse you may have thought that for many years and just haven't been able to wrap your brain around how to get out and we understand that and it is okay to be in that position and we we here will not judge you for staying where you're at what we will say is that we are trying to give you the tools to reach out for help. We are trying to give you the tools to make decisions in the midst of fog. It, you know, like if somebody is so sick that they can't feed themselves, we're trying to spoon feed you the information so that you don't have to make the decision. So none of this is like a judgment on you because we've both been in the situation where we could have gotten out a lot sooner than we did and we endured it because we thought it was the best thing for for us to do because of the way that we were taught about marriage and divorce in the cult. Mm -hmm. We allowed, quote unquote, allowed ourselves to continue to be abused, even though we knew we probably should get out. And so we would never sit in judgment of anyone who's in that situation. And if you know someone that is in that situation, I would highly recommend that you never ever tell someone in that situation, well, why don't you just leave? If you're trying to help someone like a family member get out or a friend or something like that, don't ever say that because it will not help. They won't. Sorry. Bedtime hugs. They hit the wall, pound their fist or throw things, and then they want credit for not having hit you. So Marcy kind of explained that in one of her videos that he would just barely miss her punching the wall put a hole in the wall and well, I didn't hit you or the thing with the, the glass shattering. And well, I knew it wasn't going to hit her and hurt her. So yeah, it's just, it's physical intimidation of if it had been closer, you would have been, you know, abused at that time. And it's to try and control your behavior by intimidating you with physical force. So that is, kind of a verbal, physical, emotional wrapped up all into to one is using their physical stature to intimidate you. It's a, an abuse burrito. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that we're gonna have to coin that phrase and we're gonna have to put that on a t-shirt. Yes. <laughs> I reject your abuse burrito. <laughs> Oh, man. This went a lot longer than I thought it was going to. Yeah. This one is probably a big one to cover. Verbal is really a bigger one, I think. So I that's think a-, a lot of it is new- nuanced and kind of not talked about a lot. Yes. Because, 
you know, like we said in the beginning, the the line between a, an argument mm -hmm. of people who have lost their temper temporarily and constant, consistent verbal abuse can be very hard to discern, right? And so we hope that these bullet points checklist, I will leave a link to the website where I obtained these resources for you at the bottom. And I will also try to add a hotline of a national abuse hotline. 1-800-799-7233. If you feel like you are experiencing any of these and you're not sure if the number of things you're experiencing would be considered abuse, I highly encourage you to reach out to a professional, reach out to a hotline and say, I am experiencing this and I don't know if this is abuse. Is this normal? And I did that a lot with my sister. I'm like, is this normal? Like, is this what marriage is like? I was so confused. What is normal and what is unrealistic and abuse? I mean, I, I knew it wasn't right, but I just didn't know it was abuse. And I would say, don't just ask one source, ask two or three different sources. Because when I first started searching, I got a wrong student person and I tried to tell them and they didn't hear me and they didn't realize they just didn't have enough experience. And so I didn't get the help I needed at, in that moment. Mm -hmm. I did later. So yeah. keep asking, <laughs> keep reaching out if you and don't get assistance the first time. Yeah, absolutely. And if you if you don't feel comfortable reaching out to anyone and you do want to reach out to us, we are on the social medias. You can send us a message. You can email us. There is, I think, the About tab on our channel. We'll give you a link to our email. I believe it is on some of the platforms for the, the audio podcast. If you are listening on the audio podcast, we are on YouTube. I am going to add some graphics to this to kind of help visually see this checklist if you would prefer to see it rather than listen to it or you know go back to reference it you can i will put the things on the youtube and the link is down below so i think with that our brains have processed enough tonight <sighs> so a few announcements we are discussing possibly going to once every other week for podcasting and putting out the podcast. It is a lot on me to handle the editing, the posting. I do all the, the techie stuff. <laughs> so with my full-time job and navigating a new school with two of the boys, and hopefully they will be graduated both in a month or two, some of my time will be freed up. But in the meantime, we are going to probably stick to every other week. Thank you so much for all of y'all for listening, for all of the likes and comments and shares and the new subscribers that we have. We really appreciate all of you. Thank you for joining us on this podcast. We hope that you will join us on our next podcast and come join the rebellion. Bye. Bye. <laughs>